Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances that your lotus feet, Maharaj. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to your wonderful services, Maharaj. Um, if you could kindly brief us today from Canto 7, Chapter 4, verse number 19. Thank you, Maharaj. Whenever you're ready, you can take the call over. Hare Krishna. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Dalitam Nijitam Kap Kub Ekarad Visayan Priyan Yitopa Jo Sam Bunjano Natripyad Ajitendriyaha. Translation. In spite of achieving the power to control in all directions, in spite of enjoying all types of dear sense gratification as much as possible, Narani Kashipu was dissatisfied because instead of controlling the senses, he remained their servant. Report. This is an example of a Suric life. Atheists can advance materially and create an extremely comfortable situation for the senses, but because they are controlled by the senses, they cannot be satisfied. This is the effect of modern civilization. Materialists are very much advanced in enjoying money and women, yet dissatisfaction prevails within human society because human society cannot be happy and peaceful without Krishna consciousness. As far as material sense gratification is concerned, materialists may go on increasing their enjoyment as far as they can imagine, but because people in such a material condition are servants of their senses, they cannot be satisfied. Rani Kashipu was a vivid example of this dissatisfied state of humanity. Om Gyan Timiranda Syagana Jana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yelatas Mai Shri Gurave Namaha Namaung Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasaya Bhutale Sri Mahti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudamani Pacharine Nirm se sa sun yavari pasyat yade satarine. Panchakalpa, the rubis cha, kripa sindu pe eva cha, patitanam, pavane vyo, vaishnavi vyo na mahona maha. Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda. Sri Advaita Gadat Har, Sivasari Gaur Bhakta Rindam. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Mm. So sometimes it is mentioned, both by the Shastras and by the Acharyas, that the goal of, the, of life is to achieve happiness, lasting peace and happiness. And so accepting that as a principle of Truism, we find that there are many persons who pursue happiness in different ways. Some people think that happiness is getting as much material things as you can. Others have a different idea that happiness is actually a state of mind where even if you have material things or don't have material things, it's the state of mind that you have to attain in order to achieve a sense of happiness. And there's others who say that you have to find a particular goal in life and pursue that goal, become absorbed in that goal. And even, even before you achieve that goal, you are happy because you are in the flow of that the activities that bring you to that goal. Therefore, you're feeling some happiness. Others think that physical sensations are actually forms of happiness. 
some quick fix or some quick fling with some man or woman. Others say happiness is uh, doing good to others, working not for yourself, but for the benefit of others and giving others satisfaction and inspiration by the activities you perform. They're compassionate, they're concerned, they leave their own interests behind and they work for the benefit of others. Others say that happiness is actually part of your DNA, your physical makeup. And if you have the right DNA, then you're 50% there and the rest is situation. And if the situation comes and it corresponds with your positive DNA, then you can move forward and feel happy in different situations. So there's a whole gamut of books written about how to be happy, what is happening, what is not happening. Like a common, um, think a common denominator for the what the material is the happiness is acquiring things and enjoying those things. Others who are a little bit more advanced to say things can't give you happiness because things don't have feeling and cannot reciprocate in an emotional way. And happiness is actually stimulating the emotions. And so we have a whole series of experts who have written books on happiness and what is actually happy. Yes. In the scriptures, it says that there are two kinds of people who are actually happy. The enlightened sage, one who has realized himself distinct from this body and is fixed in the goal of life, of devotional service to the Lord. And they're happy because they're, on the, they're engaged in spiritual activities. And there's another category of happiness which the scriptures give concessionary statements towards. And that is the, the gross fool who's so foolish they can't even understand that they're suffering. And they say, whatever you don't know, it's okay because it won't hurt you. So the gross fool, he's an idiot. He's intoxicated. And he thinks that his state of existence of just gross sense gratification and accepting every situation for an opportunity to enjoy. And what is he enjoying? He's trying to enjoy some collection of illusions or some hallucinogenic ideas. So he lives in a dream world and he's not really grounded in anything tangible. That person is also happy. It's the happiness of fools. So Bhagavatam categorizes these two classes of people of actually happy. The gross fool who knows nothing and the, uh, the enlightened sage who is fixed in pure love for the Supreme. So here we have Haranyakasipu. His program is to acquire as much position, power, control as he can, and then exploit the resources of material energy more and more. But it says that he's using his mind, his senses, and his intelligence to do that. And so his material mind, senses, and intelligence are controlling him in a direction which makes him think that by getting all of these things, he can be happy. But here it says that satisfaction is a principle of happiness. And if one is not satisfied, there's no question of happiness. Sometimes we also say if one is not peaceful, there can be no question of happiness. 
And so Harani Kasipu, being led around by his senses, is like a dog on a leash who's being pulled by the master in different directions. And the dog doesn't know which way he's going to go next. So he's in a, the dog is in, he's really uh, struggling because he's being led around in a, in a blind way towards whatever he thinks he, he has no idea where he's going. So Rani Kasipu is like that. He's just being led around by his senses. And the senses are material. And of course, for materialists, senses are material. For spiritualists, the senses are spiritual. So the material senses are limited. And therefore, whatever category of happiness he thinks he's experiencing, whether it's some sex life, some intoxication, some conquering over his so-called enemies, it's like a jolt of feeling of satisfaction that immediately leaves within a few moments and leaves one unsatisfied. And this is generally the condition of the materialistic society. They look for a quick fix for happiness. Anything that they can get that somehow or other gives them some feeling of euphoria or some uh, zesty experience of sensual stimulation, they consider, oh, wow, well, this is happiness. But they don't know that happiness is actually the constitutional position of the living being. And that happiness is attained when one cuts through the illusion of the so-called programs for happiness that are being presented by modern society. Therefore, we have to go back into the tradition of culture and antiquity to come to what is actually real happiness, and that is uh, devotion to the Supreme Lord. What that the activities that make up devotion to the Supreme Lord bring away, about, bring away, bring about a cutting away of the layers of illusion that keeps one from experiencing happiness. Happiness is the nature of the living being's existence, but it's covered by these layers of illusion, such as a desire to enjoy material things, the, the desire to experience some success in life, material success, the desire for position, power, control, all of these things. When one is no longer chasing after these illusory forms of happiness and takes to the process of Krishna consciousness. Now I say that in a sense that if one is taking to the process of Krishna consciousness and is still chasing after these illusory forms of happiness, then that happiness is not being awakened. It's like trying to build a fire by throwing water on it at the same time. So if one wants to be happy, in spiritual life, spiritual life is happy life because it unroots or uproots all of the all of the coverings of material existence that cause one to either think they're happy in a false way or actually some kind of happiness that is actually not really happiness. It is simply a, a relief from material suffering. So for one who actually wants real happiness, they have to focus completely on devotional service to the Lord. And at one stage of developing activities in devotional service, that means a certain level of the laters of material contamination due to the desire to enjoy in this material world have been removed. And one starts to feel happy. That feeling of happiness initially enters as a sense of peacefulness and satisfaction. 
and then it starts to grow exponentially more and more as one engages in devotional service, especially hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. As that grows, then happiness starts to manifest, and then that happiness comes into joyfulness. Joyfulness comes into uh, 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 ecstatic ecstasy. Ecstasy comes into bliss, and bliss reaches higher and higher levels where one becomes overwhelmed with unlimited forms of enjoyment constantly at every moment because that is the soul's nature. So happiness is not something that you have to create a, a mental state in order to achieve. That's the materialist. They say, well, yeah, maybe the material things don't give you happiness, but it's just a state of mind you have to un, uh, unleash and apply into your consciousness and then you could be happy. But that state of mind is just another form of material desire and so on. Therefore, it's, it continues to cover the soul's real happiness. Now, the real happiness is to engage in devotional service and cut away the layers of illusion which cause one not to experience their own natural happiness, which is intrinsic indigenous to the soul's existence. To be happy is natural. And to be continuously happy is natural also because happiness is not intermittent. Intermittent happiness is, an, is just an indication of happiness that exists. But when it becomes intermittent, one cannot feel fully satisfied. Only when it's continuous, Therefore, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Rama Bhuta Prasanatma Na Soshiti Na Kangshiti Sama Sarveshu Bhuteshu Mad Bhakti Lavate Param. Rama Bhuta Prasanatma, the living entity becomes Prasanatma. Prash, 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 prasha, prasha, prashant means happiness, but not just happiness. Uh, ecstatic feelings of joy. And what is the symptom? They don't hanker for anything material. They don't lament if they lose something material. They're self-satisfied because they're experiencing the happiness of their own existence through the process of serving the Lord and engaging in various spiritual activities, especially chanting the holy names and engaging in various types of uh, activities such as um, taking prasadam, reading Srimad Bhagavatam, seeing the beautiful form of the deities. All of these are principles of happiness which do two things. They give a sense of, of upliftment and at the same time they cut away the coatings of material coverings which are which are blocking one's unlimited source of happiness. In the first verse of the Shikshastakam prayer, it explains that uh, that uh, Anandam Bhudi Vardhanam, Lord Chaitanya is speaking, and he's listing the seven benefits that one receives by chanting the holy name. And one of the benefits is an anandam buddhi vardhanam. Anandam means joyfulness, happiness, spiritual happiness. Buddhi means deep. And vardhanam means in, in, in not only deep, but unlimited. So the happiness that the living entity can experience has no limit. It's interesting because the soul is called jiva. Jiva means limited. That's another definition. Well, the jiva is limited because it is tiny. It has a tendency to either exist in the material realm or the spiritual realm, and it's moved by either one. Uh, but therefore, it's limited in all categories. But when it comes in contact with the unlimited source of pleasure, that is Krishna himself, 
then that unlimited happiness awakens that limited happiness that one experiences ordinarily and brings it to the stage of un unlimitedness. So although the soul is the jiva, small, limited, its happiness is unlimited. So that means there's no end to the heights that happiness can experience. And uh, what we experience in this material world, even in Krishna consciousness in our present situation, is just a little upliftment from material suffering. But real happiness is the soul's connection with the source of happiness, Krishna. And when that connection is made through the process of bhakti, then that, that happiness flows naturally. And one forgets about, doesn't even notice, the other things that people are chasing after in this material world for so-called ephemeral happiness. It's, it's all it is. And you'll see, no one in the material world is happy because they don't know where happiness is and they don't know what is real happiness. They don't know what it is and they don't know where to find it. Rani Kashipu is an epitome of material success. He, he had so many ways that he could not be killed. And he was basking in this idea that he was immortal. And he was going on in a very, uh, you know, mindless way, just trying to gain more and more power, more position, more sense gratification. But it says here, this is a very powerful verse, that he was never satisfied. So we should take heart that material acquisition or chasing after material happiness in any way that it's defined will never bring satisfaction or happiness. Unless we understand that, then we cannot move into the area of real happiness, which is Krishna consciousness. We have to be fully convinced that there's no happiness, no matter how it appears, because you'll see the materialists uh, in their pursuit of happiness and their constant frustration to not to to not achieve it. They're always coming up with new ideas by which they can they think they can find happiness, and that gives them a sense of of the hope that. Soon, if I pursue this method, I'll be happy. And so devotees have to be aware that this is another form of illusion presented by the material energy simply to divert one's attention away from Krishna and transcendental happiness. <laughs> okay. So Harani Kashipu. Powerful, but miserable. <laughs> materially powerful, materially miserable. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for this sweet and wonderful class, short class. Yes, 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 you're so right, so correct. We keep Keep chasing happiness, even after knowing that we cannot find it in the material world. It only exists in the spiritual world. Nevertheless, we keep chasing. We keep going after it. and it's, We fall into the illusion, and hence we get hurt. Thank you so much for the wonderful example. Um, devotees, should you have any questions, please don't hesitate either to unmute yourself, ask the questions to His Holiness, or you can raise your hand. Maharaj, one question. So um, as devotees, as practicing devotees or sadhak, sadh, uh, you know, people are generally living in the material world. So you have to deal with day to day. I mean, you want to be uh, happy. Is it is it wrong to be happy in the physical world? Is, is it wrong to aspire for success in every field of life? Um, materially and then 
go back spiritually whenever the time is? There's Should no there sense. be guilt? What is the success of a material world? To achieve some, some goal in life, like I want this person to be my marriage partner. I want to get this amount of money. I want to get this position. I want to have this particular facility so I can move around more freely. And these are all illusions because everyone is controlled by the material energy and by their senses. So yes, it's not it's not only wrong, it's an illusion. Hmm. Krishna consciousness is the, the principle of happiness. Not anything in this material world. If you are achieving certain goals in this material world, what is the purpose of that achievement? If you use those things in the service of the Lord, to please the Lord, to serve the Lord with these activities, then you, you can accept the fact that I am in that situation and therefore I can make the, the best use of a bad bargain by making by connecting everything with Krishna. All right. Otherwise, it's just you're just um, you know, and you're flapping your wings, but you're not moving. <laughs> right, right, right. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, yeah. Get the vairagya should be the way. Yeah. We say there's no happiness in in anything material. Because it's material. Material means temporary. Material mm -hmm. means based on the body and the senses. The body means senses, the intelligence, the mind. These are all ephemeral uh, conscious states of consciousness that we achieve when we come to this material world. <laughs> Devotees, I hear some noise. If you could kindly mute yourself, His Holiness is speaking. Yeah, so this, this idea to chase after these things is to chase, is to like, you, you can see, just like if you see smoke flying in the air or drifting in the air. So you think, oh, well, I can see that smoke. I'm going to grab it. So you take your hand and you try to grab the smoke. And then what do you got? Nothing. You don't have any. You can open your hand. There's no smoke inside. <laughs> All right, right. Uh, this is this is the this is the happiness that comes. This is the fertility that comes by chasing material things. The question is, we're not. The point is, we're not material. We're spiritual. Yes. So the, the, the scriptures give some concession. They say there is happiness in the material world, but it's only one drop. Mm. If someone's in the desert and they're thirsty and someone comes along with a drop of water, you think that's going to quench their thirst? So it makes them more thirsty. Mm. So just like being in the desert, when you want water, you, you, you start to hallucinate because of not getting water and you're wandering in this sandy environment. And you want water so bad that you actually think you see water. Mm. What it is, is the sun is reflecting off the sand and it creates this idea of a, a, a mirage. And this mirage is some beautiful lake sitting there in the middle of the desert. So you go chasing after it and you, you try to drink it and all you get is hot, some more hot burning sand. So in the same way, we are chasing after these, uh, these uh, ideas that have been presented to us by our parents, by society, by culture, by whatever. And uh, we're not satisfied. If people in the material world were satisfied, there wouldn't be any problems. But there's mm. still full of problems. 
this is an indication that nobody's happy. People who are happy don't cause problems <laughs> or don't have problems. <laughs> and if they have a problem because they're happy and they have they have knowledge, they can they know how to to uh, dispense with that or deal with it. They're not moved by situations. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Shiva Kumar Prabhu, if you could go ahead with your question, please. Hare Krishna, thank you, Mataji. And our terms. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances at your lotus feet. Maharaj, one question on uh, the topic of happiness. Um, in the initial years, Maharaj, seems that most of our efforts are going into anarthanivriti. Uh, that's one thing. And also, the second thing, Maharaj, uh, the mind is used to getting quick results in any of the material pursuits. From my experience, I am speaking, Maharaj. And to see some change in Krishna consciousness, it seems it's taking a really lot of time. And uh, there isn't this uh, patience or perseverance. It seems to be very difficult to kind of put that quality into practice, Maharaj. I just wanted to hear your wisdom and advice on that. Do you know the difference between allopathic medicine and Ayurvedic medicine? Uh, yes, Maharaj, it takes time. <laughs> Ayurvedic medicine takes time. What does allopathic medicine deal with? The symptoms. Not with the disease, but with the symptoms. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it works fast because they just kill the symptoms without killing the disease. That's how generally how allopathic medicine operates. But uh, Ayurvedic goes to the root of the problem, understands what is the cause, and based on the psychophysical nature of the individual, they give a regimen of lifestyle and medicine centered around diet and various types of medicines, which in the long run will bring about a complete cure of the disease, elimination of the disease, and not simply elimination of the symptoms mm. so mm. Thing in the material world you know people they're they're not getting any happiness they're just getting rid of these symptoms of misery for uh, a little bit and then because the disease is still there the symptoms will return again mm. Mm. in the same way if we take to the process of krishna consciousness Ultimately, you're moving towards eternal happiness. And at certain stages in the process of Krishna consciousness, you will experience relief from suffering, a sense of peacefulness, and actual happiness. When it will become intermittent, but as one continues, that intermittence will start to manifest in a more continuous way. And then when it becomes fully continuous, then you're on this you're on the transcendental platform. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. If you say, Well, I want to go to the university and therefore I want to get my degree in the first year, then they won't let you in. <laughs> mm. You have to go through the whole requirements. And so in the same way, spiritual life is a process. Try to understand it. It's a process. And the process is to remove the coverings of material attachments, and which is the disease of the living entity, which is covering their true happiness and their true knowledge. Mm -hmm. And how is that working? We're coming in contact with a higher energy, and that is spiritual energy. Spiritual energy destroys the coverings of material energy, and awakens the spiritual energy, which is of our nature. We are spiritual. So when spiritual hits spiritual, then there is a connection. As long as the material is blocking it, there's no, no connection. So the process of bhakti is to cut away that material and awaken that spiritual essence and connect with that higher spiritual essence. And that is Krishna consciousness. That higher spiritual essence is is the process of bhakti yoga. Hmm. 
it works. If it didn't, if it didn't work, we wouldn't be sitting around here for thousands of years talking about it. <laughs> and people are experiencing it too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I uh, would, if you, yeah, if you have time, you want to hear something? This is a little lengthy. Should I read it, uh, Nina? Yes, Maharaj, please. Maharaj, yes, sure, Maharaj, please go ahead. This is an example of an experience someone just recently had. Okay. And you can hear, if you listen carefully, you'll see that the person had had no preconceived notion of what was happening, when it was happening, but then later understood everything. Uh, let me see if I can, let me see, where am I going here? Um, okay, here we go. It's a little long. It's called, it's by a devotee from, from uh, Mayapur called the Chintya Chaitanya. He said, my mother's encounter with the Vishnu Dudas. What you are about to read is an unbelievable story made believable through the transcendental teachings of Srimad Bhagavatam presented to us by Srimad Prabhupada. Here we go. My father left this world in Sri Dham Mayapur in the most holy month of Kartik in the late morning hours, a little before noon on Saturday, 4 November 2023. On the same day, in the early morning hours, around 3 a.m., when my mother was deep asleep, she was jolted out of bed by what she saw. Please bear in mind as you read this account that my mother had no previous idea about the Vishnu Dudas. She had no clue that they even existed, but to speak of any idea how they looked like, what their color was, etc. Her complete ignorance about the Vishnu Dudas lends compelling cred credibility to this gripping account. Here we go. The room in our house in Mayapur in which my parents were staying was earlier my bedroom, study room, and study room. My nine-foot-long study table stands against the east side wall. My mother in her deep sleep saw a, around six or seven or more charming beings whose faces were illuminated like sunshine enter the room and then sit cross-legged in a row on the top of my study table. She heard the sound of each of them sitting down. There are only four features about them that she re recollects, their color, eyes, ears, and feet. A color, a shade that is neither light blue, nor dark blue, nor black. A very attractive color, so attractive that she would never forget it until she died, she said. Eyes, their eyeballs are not two-dimensional like human beings, but three-dimensional. Ears, their ears are not like human beings, but resemble the ears of an elephant. Not in size, but how they stand out on their face. Their ears are, however, well-proportioned according to their faces. When I told my mother I could not understand how beings with such eyes and ears could look beautiful, she matter-of-factly replied that since I have seen only human beings so far, it would be difficult to conceive or comprehend the charm of their faces. She added that she herself has not seen any human being in this world who can compare with them. So it would not be possible to comprehend the elegance of those beings using human experience. Feet. She did not see the soles of their feet, but she saw them all sitting cross-legged. I asked her for further details like how their hands looked, what dress they wore. She was not able to recollect any of that. She, however, said that all of those beings looked identical. I then asked her for her impression of what she saw. 
was it scary? She said that the beings themselves were not at all scary. They had a childlike attraction. But as a whole, what she saw was scary because she did not know who they were, why they had come in her room, and what they were doing in her room. She then tried to say, Krishna, Krishna, but could not articulate the sounds. Then she tried to call out my wife's name. Again, she could not articulate any sound. At that point, either one of the beings or someone else stacked three Tulsi leaves in succession, one on top of the other, right in the middle of her forehead. When the third Tulsi leaf was stacked on her forehead, she was jolted out of her sleep. She sat up on her bed, sweating and looking for the beings on my study table. There were none. She immediately wondered, why did those beings come? Did they come to take me away? She saw that she was fine and so immediately panic panicked, wondering if they had come to take her husband. She immediately patted him to check if he was gone. So she was relieved. He woke up and she was relieved. However, she could not go back to sleep because of what she had seen until my wife woke up at 4 a.m. in the other room and came to their room to check on them. Guru Maharaj asked me to check with her if the leaves stacked on her forehead were Tulsi leaves or Bilva leaves. I guess that was to distinguish between Vishnu Deers and Shiva Deers. She replied with absolute certainty, Tulsi, Tulsi, Tulsi. Initially, she had the impression that the beings were women. Gopi Stri is the expression she used. But when I asked her what made her think that they were women, since she could not recollect neither their dress, nor their hair, nor any other feature, she immediately conceded that she was not sure of their gender, but had the impression that they were women. However, when I asked her to list any identification of the women that she saw in them, she could not list any. It was clear to her then that she did not actually know their gender. Although my mother chants eight rounds of Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, she is a follower of Mother Durga. I asked her if she knew who those celestial beings were. She said she had no clue. Then she initially asked, were they Mother Durga's pe per persons, people? I replied, no way. They were Vishnu Buddhas. Then I explained to her about the description of the Vishnu Buddhas in the Srimad Bhagavatam. As she was narrating to me what she saw, she said that the hairs on her body were standing on end in happiness and wondering and wonder. She added that whenever she thought about those celestial beings, she experienced the hairs on her body standing on them. She said, your study table is also now blessed. I replied that the hairs on my body were standing on them too, hearing her narration. My mother had been married to my father for more than 50 years. I had seen how attached she was to him and how she would serve him meticulously. So I told her that I had imagined that she would be a total wreck after my dad's departure. She replied that she too had the exact same thought that she would be a total wreck after my de dad's depart departure until she saw those celestial beings. That changed everything because she said she was now absolutely sure that my dad had gone to an auspicious destination and that his departure was glorious. This write-up would be incomplete without a brief explicit note about my dad's departure. He was diagnosed with prostate cancer more than seven years ago in July 2016. He had not complained of pain even once in all these years since then not even on the day of his departure. He had not been hospitalized even for a day in the 86 years of his life. He had moved permanently to Mayapur with my mother a year ago. At the time of his departure, my wife, Shiromani Devi Dasu, a doctor, 
my wife's friend, Denise Dupriya, a qualified nurse, and my mother were by my father's side, and Srila Prabhupada's chanting tape was loudly playing in the room. More specifically, after he had breakfast of hot dosa, he lied down to rest. When my wife was concerned that his blood sugar level was not good, she quickly prepared some glucose water, went to his bed, lifted him up to sit him up, held him in his arms and began to feed him glucose water with a spoon. He drank three or four sips and then suddenly his head flopped onto my wife's chest. Denise de Priya immediately opened his eyes, his pupils were dilated. She quickly put a pulse ox meter in his finger. There was no pulse. My wife and Denise de loudly began to chant the Hare Krishna mantra, along with Srila Prabhupada's chanting, which was going on nonstop in the room. He was gone. He had breathed his last in my wife's arms. He had a beautiful smile. On his face. <laughs> eloquence is truth spoken concisely. Who can be more eloquent than Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami? Translation If you are indeed interested in logic and argument, kindly apply it to the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And if you do so, you will find it strikingly wonderful. You have all read in so many places in the Srimad Bhagavatam and elsewhere, Srila Prabhupada's astute comments that if Krishna can do so many amazing things for those who are not practitioners of Krishna consciousness, how much more would he do for those who are practicing Krishna consciousness? What a great fortune Srila Prabhupada has brought upon all of us and the whole world for the asking. Who can be, who can even understand or describe our great Fortune. End of narration. Wonderful. So, that experience that mother had was just prior to the, her husband leaving. So they came to take her husband. She got the chance to see them. And as it, as it explains, because she saw them, she she felt no loss upon his leaving. In fact, she felt happy that he had obtained a great destination. So these are once in a while these things happen. In fact, they happen much more than we know because a lot of times people don't can't process what's happening or what they're experiencing. Or sometimes they understand it, but they can't, they keep it quiet because they know no one else will understand. So Krishna consciousness works. <laughs> and the Bhagavatam is giving you everything you need to understand about how the process works and how you, you can apply yourself to the process and achieve the, the perfect position that is to go back home back to the spiritual world which is the own which is the goal of Krishna consciousness therefore when we say there's no happiness in the material world we say that with great joy because at the same time if there was any happiness in this material world we would still be chasing that happiness right and thinking about our real goal in life which is Krishna Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that story with us, Maharaj. It, it's really nice. It's very good. Thank you, Maharaj. It's and thanks for the Maharaj. wonderful conclusion. Sorry, Maharaj. It just happened November 4th. Yeah. yeah. That was only like three months ago. No, not even two and a half months ago. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. We will continue with the question answer session. Um, Sri Devi Mataji, you had a question for His Holiness. Yes, thank you, Nina. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Well, glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Guru Maharaj, we understand.
understand that we as spiritual beings can only be happy when we are engaging in loving service to Krishna. But Srila Prabhupada also said extreme poverty is a great uh, deterrent. It's very difficult to practice spiritual life when one doesn't have the basics with which to live, such as food, water, shelter, clothing, etc. Because uh, the person is so involved in just trying to survive or attain these things, they cannot focus on Krishna consciousness. So how is it possible until we reach, or sometimes it's even said that young girls, they do better after marriage because now they are a little more stabilized, having a husband to support, encourage them in Krishna consciousness and their Krishna consciousness blossoms more after being situated nicely materially. So is it a, a difficulty if we are, you know, lacking something that we cannot progress in our Krishna consciousness? There's another statement, which is a more direct and more uh, complete statement, is that there's no material impediment for becoming Krishna conscious. And so, are you starving? Even if you have no food, you can walk up to one of the neighbors and say, I, I'm hungry, and, and you get some food without having to worry about paying for it. The body is never starved. There's always food around. The thing is, when we give up Krishna, and we look to, to uh, achieve success in our own endeavors, we will always find shortages and problems. And if we stay with Krishna, even no matter whether we are materially affluent or in a poverty situation, we'll always have whatever we need to live because Krishna will arrange that. So that statement you were saying is more or less about the gross materialists who are still attached to their ideas on how to become successful, how to become happy. But you can chant Hare Krishna whether you are you know, in a palace or underneath the tree. You can always get food. Food is always available. In fact, it's so available, there's more than you need. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. We have some couple of comments on the on the chat box. Sindhu Rao Prabhuji is saying, Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance. Very wonderful class. Thank you, Maharaj. Very enlightening session. Every word was pure nectar. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. We have Shiromani Nandarani Mataji saying, Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances at your lotus feet. Very well explained. What is real happiness? Wonderful class. If possible, can you share the letter of His Grace a Chaitanya, um, Chaitanya Das Prabhu's letter? Yeah. Um, I'll send it to one person and then that person can collect you know, email addresses for anyone who wants it. And then we can, that'll expedite the whole program. So give me one person to send it to, and that person will be the person you all write your email addresses to. And then, uh, like that. Maybe Vinita Mataji or... Uh... You can share your uh, phone number or email address to, with Maharaj uh, privately on the chat. That would be great. Um, uh, you, you're speaking to me? Like, no. To, hmm. I think it was uh, said to Sindhu, Sindhu Rani Mataji. What was it? I have, but I have. Shiromani Nandarani Mataji. I think I have your email address. Yes, you have mine, Maharaj, for sure. If you want, you can email it to me. I will share it with the with the Matajis. Better than that, um, just give me a phone number, a WhatsApp phone number, and then uh, I'll send it to there, and then they can distribute it from there. 
because what I just read is not on my email, it's on my email, WhatsApp. So, Nina um, Mataji, you can put your phone number to Maharaj. Um, okay. I through the email you can uh, or you can write here so that he can send it to you you can pass it to everyone yeah okay Mataj, i will do that yeah. um here it comes you tear it up copy it <laughs> here i'm sending it to you right now maharaj mm -hmm. it's a direct message to you mm -hmm. okay well, this is a this is a uh, a U.S. number, right? Yes, Maharaj. Um, okay. Uh, put it up again. I did it. Okay. 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 Whenever you can, Maharaj, it doesn't have to be at this minute. All right, I got all the information. I'm ready yes. to go. You can send it and I'll share it in the group. Okay, good. Thank you. Sakshi Mataji, if you could go ahead with your question, Mata. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my most humble obeisances and your lotus feet. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, so thank you so much, Maharaj, for the beautiful lecture. Uh, so uh, from the class, uh, you said one uh, uh, verse. Uh, it was, na sochiti, na kangshiti, means we either uh, uh, hanker for the future or we... Uh, lemons for the past but because of that uh, we hardly live in the present and uh, maybe cherish the moment uh, so it uh, like personally it happens with me that uh, it happens quite often with me that I, I am there physically but mentally somewhere else so the present it totally looks like an illusion so I my question is why uh, this happens and how to come out of this illusion. That's it, Maharaj. The tendency for the conditioned souls to always project the future as a way for happiness. Because either because we're not feeling happiness in the present, we're making plans in the present for future happiness, rather than taking the opportunity to live in the moment. If we live in the moment, we will we will get the most out of the every moment. Because if you study the element of time, there is only the present. The past and future are just con conceptions of the mind. Past is, is, is a history and, a, and the future is a mystery. The present is the only reality. You can only you can only function according to where you are at the moment. You can make plans for the future, but if your planning is not in connection with, you know, what is actual success in life. In other words, you can plan to, to serve the Lord in different ways. That is all right. That's also living in the moment. Because when you perform devotional service, you are not living in the future or lamenting about the past. You're living in the moment. So the moment is the only reality. We dream about the future. We lament about the past. But in other words, we're not there in the present. We're missing the present, and the present is the foundation by which the future becomes uh, successful. As the future will become the present eventually. So live in the moment. What you do now will determine what will happen later.
But what you what you do now, you can at any moment you can serve Krishna. And therefore, if you're serving Krishna at any mo at any at any time, in that moment you are living in reality, not in the illusion of the past and future. Because devotional service is above the element of time. It has nothing to do with time. So we simply waste time dreaming about the future. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For such a nectarian class and for such wonderful solutions to all our mundane problems. Devotees, any questions for His Holiness? Maharaj, your class has made everybody very sublime. I hope you're right. <laughs> no, I don't see any last minute questions. All right. I think somebody just popped up a question. Hare Krishna Maharaj Ji, Pranam. Sometimes we, meet, we need to be in situations where we need to be with people who enjoy material things. What should we do in such circumstances, though we know it gives no happiness? Well, are we obligated to be in that situation? Let's say yes, Maharaj, then... <laughs> Usually it's some kind of family responsibility or family function. And uh, therefore you have to somehow or other keep your consciousness on Krishna and not acquiesce to the mundane. And there's, a, there's a story where one factory, this was in India, there were all the factory workers were Vaishnavas and they were coming to work with Tilak, Kopi Chandan, every day. The factory was sold to a Muslim and then he made a decree that no one can wear Tilak anymore. And if anyone wears Tilak, they will be and they will be thrown out of their job. So the next day, everyone except one person uh, didn't put T-Lock on. And then this owner, Islamic owner, approached that man who had the T-Lock and he said, why are you wearing it? He said, this is my religion. And this is what I believe in, and I'm going to wear it. Uh, he impressed the uh, owner so much that the owner said, well, all of you cannot wear it, but he can wear it. <laughs> because he stood up for what he believed was right. Uh, so if we live by character, by values, by principles and not live by convenience. Then actually, even though people don't agree with us, there's a sense of respect that comes our way because we're living according to what is right. And Krishna's there. So if you're forced to be in these situations, remain Krishna conscious. It's not that you have to, in order to patronize other people's feelings, you have to become like them. You can still be respectful, 
you can still be friendly. But you should never sacrifice your beliefs for the sake of uh, having some kind of fleeting relationship or a moment in that fleeting relationship. Be a devotee 24 7 and not just when it's easy. Thank you, Maharaj. Maybe Devi can tell you her own personal story about that. You can maybe answer the question better than I can. Right. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and giving simple solutions to all of us. Seriously. Krishna consciousness doesn't depend on anything material. It's a matter of consciousness, I say. Be conscious of Krishna. Right? And act according to religious principles. Those who sacrifice the spiritual for the material lose both. Right. Okay. Thank you so much, Mark. Okay, so I'll take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for your wonderful answers. Okay. Any other questions that we have from devotees? Maharaj, should we end the call or? Yeah. Oh, hey. Maharaj, do you have, there is one last question, I think, from Hemi Mataji. Do you have some time or? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, Hemi Mataji, go ahead with your question, please. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhanwad Pranam. Uh, just have a question. Like, there's a family member of mine who actually chants uh, Ram Nam. So, um, should 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 I be encouraging him to do Hare Krishna mantra? Ramari Morti Sukalami Amena Tishtam Nanavatara Atarogu Venusakin Shu. Krishna Swayam Samabhavad Paramam Pamanyo Govinda Mari Purusham Samaham Dajami Ram is also the Supreme Person, how do you that? We celebrate his appearance every year. We chant the holy name. Sometimes we we chant Hari Ram. Some people actually understand that that Hari Ram is actually Ram Chandra. Others think it's Lord Balaram. Others believe it's Krishna who is Radhika Raman. But whatever way people identify the name of Ram, if it refers to the absolute personality of Godhead, it is it is a spiritually Correct. So, Lord Shiva worships Ram. There are Ram Bhaktas, Krishna Bhaktas. Yeah. 
I wouldn't. I wouldn't try to. I would appreciate his. Thank you, Maharaj. Tanvikram. Thank you so much, Maharaj, uh, for your very, very valuable time. I don't see any other questions. Uh, Maharaj, if, uh, if it's okay, shall we end the call here? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Maharaj. One chakal patar paksha. That's in the way. Patar power ne piyo vaishnav ve piyo namo namaha. Thank you.